Hello everybody, and welcome to the second episode of Creating Kirby Maker. If you missed the first episode of this series, in short, I've been working on a sandbox level creation game like Super Mario Maker, but with the Kirby franchise instead. And I spent the last episode getting some of the core features implemented and out of the way, such as tile rendering, level resizing, and zooming. And in this episode, I want to flesh out some of these early features and really start developing this into the game that I am envisioning. So without any further ado, let's get started. All right, we are back in Visual Studios, and the first thing I want to do before implementing any new features is to clean up some of the code from the last episode. This process is called refactoring, and is an important part of developing a good project. Because if the code isn't designed well from the beginning, it could cause all kinds of problems down the line. One of the main things I refactored was the way the level resizing works. I mentioned towards the end of the last episode that I didn't like the look and functionality of these square resize buttons that I put on each of the sides of the level. So what I decided to do was to remove the ones from the top and left hand sides of the level and make them look more like the ones from the previous Kirby Maker. I did this because I prefer the look of the round buttons, and because the method for resizing the level was way too convoluted before in order to accommodate all four sides. Another small change that I decided to make was to actually change the name of the project itself. This was all triggered by this comment, which suggested changing the name to Kirby's Dream Designer. I really like this name and think that it has more character than just Kirby Maker, so I renamed the project and even started designing a logo for the new name. Although I haven't come up with anything that I really like yet. Now I will still be referring to this project as Kirby Maker in the titles and thumbnails of these videos for consistency, and because it's good clickbait. Once I finished the refactoring, I started implementing the first new feature, which deals with how tiles are placed down, and that is auto tiling. As of right now, the only way to make complex tiles like this ground tile connect to each other is by manually changing the texture ID with the mouse, which is extremely tedious. So to fix this, I designed a system that uses binary to determine which textures to use on tiles with this property. The way it works is that the program takes these tiles and assigns a value to each one of the cardinal directions corresponding to the binary values of each bit in a 4-bit number. And if any of the sides have a tile next to them that is the same, its value is added to a texture offset value, which is then used to select a texture from 16 different ones. And, since adding a new tile doesn't just affect the tile that is placed, but also the tiles surrounding it, the area around new tiles is updated as well, using this process. Now this solution works well except for one little detail, which is that some of the tiles like this ground tile have corner pieces that aren't accounted for using our system. One way I can fix this is to use the corners in the texture offset calculation as well as the cardinal directions. But that would mean that the number of textures required for this would jump from 16 to 256, which is just way too high. So the compromise I came up with was to use the binary system for a separate calculation just for the corners, and then to render a texture on top of the original for the corner pieces. This gives the same result visually as having 256 individual textures, but with only 32 instead. Now that we have the auto tiling system complete, there's another quality of life change that I want to implement, and this one will make it significantly easier to make variations of tiles within the game, and that's color palette support. In Kirby games, such as Kirby's Adventure, there are a variety of color palettes that are used to change the appearance of tiles, and in order to implement something like this in our project, we are going to need to utilize shaders in order to do this. If you are unfamiliar with what exactly a shader is, it's a special kind of program that's run on the GPU, and it can give us a greater level of control over the rendering process of our program. The type of shader responsible for coloring the pixels that are rendered is known as a fragment shader, and it's written in a special language called GLSL, or the GL shader language. Different graphics APIs have different shader languages, but what's nice about GLSL is that its syntax is very similar to C. Before I implemented the color palette feature though, I wanted to get a basic shader working with the program. So I created a simple one that renders every pixel in a tile as red. From here, I created a special file format called PLT that holds the color data for the color palettes, which are stored row-wise. 
This data is then loaded in using a custom parser I created, and is then passed into the fragment shader using another kind of shader called a vertex shader. These color values are then used to choose a color for each pixel based on two criteria. The first is the color palette we need to use, which is derived in a very janky way by transforming a color value passed into the vertex shader into an index which is used to select the correct color palette. And the second thing is the brightness of the pixels within the tile's texture. This is relevant because all of the textures that have color palette support have been turned into grayscale textures, and depending on how bright the pixel colors are when they're sampled from the texture, a color from the color palette is selected for the pixel being rendered. Now getting this working was an enormous challenge because of how SFML only natively supports older GLSL shaders, which made things such as passing extra data into the shaders for each tile way more difficult than it should have been. And along the way, I had some of the most bizarre rendering bugs I've ever seen. But after a long period of trial and error, I managed to get it working which means we can now create different colored versions of the same tile with very little effort. I'm glad this feature is finally done and out of the way, but we're still stuck with this bare bones tile editor, which is only going to become more annoying to use as I add more tiles to the game. So I think it's finally time to address this by updating the editor. Now, this is where I started to lose my mind because I changed the way I wanted to implement the editor multiple times over. I knew I wanted to have some kind of menu to store the tiles in, so I first tried creating these slide-out bars on the sides of the screen for storing the tiles. But I didn't really like the look of this, and it wouldn't really be convenient to use with a large number of tiles, so I needed a better solution. So, after a few more iterations, I settled onto this as my final design. Instead of having two bars, I decided that only one is necessary, and it would keep the screen a little less cluttered. And instead of having the tiles be selectable from the bar itself, you now press this tile button to drop down a menu where you could select whatever tile you'd like to use. And as you can see, I have some tiles with different color palettes as separate buttons to click on. I'm curious if any of you think I should create a separate menu for selecting the color palette, or if this is a good solution to go with. I still need to implement the recent tiles section, which will make it easier to access tiles that are used frequently, instead of having to search through a long list, especially as I add more and more of them. Now, as for the rest of this bar, I have an entity section laid out as well, where enemies and other entities will be accessible. And the remaining area is going to be used for other menus that I might want to add in the future, such as ones for music and backgrounds. So that's everything that I have for this episode. If you have any suggestions for things you would like added to this project, please leave them down in the comments below. Anyways, thank you guys as always for watching and for your wonderful support, and I will see you in the next video. Bye bye